Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Ho. Ho, Hello, fans of all ages. We are indeed the Beast of the East. Ryan Amorica, Scott Thompson, coming to you live from Studio A here at Ramapo College of New Jersey in Mawa, New Jersey. And uh, we got a lot of stuff to talk about, Scott, and most of it is not good. You hear that sound, Scott? Do you hear that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is the sound of giant fans <laughs> all across the country. No exaggeration, yeah. because last night was one of the worst giant losses. Woeful. Woeful is the word. One of the worst giant losses I've ever seen in my lifetime. Number one, it's got to be Deshaun Jackson. Yeah. This is probably number two. Yeah. Um, I mean, what is there to say? You, you, your coaching staff, your team, they, they just blew it. They choked. That is the definition of choking, and that's it, hard. Week one coming into a season with a lot of questions, um, your team actually plays a great game against a team that was supposed to beat them by a to touchdown. Blow them out of the water. No, no, I mean, not blow them out, but, but still, oh. yeah, they weren't supposed to win this game. They played a great game, and they should have won it. And, you know, let's, let's get into what went wrong. It's frustr- the thing that frustrates me, uh, we'll get into the clock management yep. later and, the, and whatever Eli told the crew and whatever, but what frustrates me is that you're going into the game with everyone on the Cowboys' side, A. You go into the game, play very well. Offense plays okay. The secondary, which was probably their biggest question on defense, played very well. Rodgers Camardi had the 57-yard fumble recovery for a touchdown. He played a phenomenal game last night. Tremaine McBride, unbelievable game last night. And basically, it was the complete opposite of what I expected. I expected the offense to go off, and I expected the defense to be... Horrendous, and it was actually the complete opposite besides the defensive line because the Cowboys' offensive line, we all know, is is obviously a force to be reckoned with, probably the best in the league. So you go into the game expecting to lose, and you get outplayed in the first half, but you're leading the first half. Second half, it seemed like all Giants to me. The Cowboys were not playing very well. Des Bryant came out of the game with a foot injury. Now he's out four to six weeks with the broken foot. And then your clock management just goes right out the window. You're up 10 points with eight minutes left in the game, and you give the game away to your division rival, the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, and it's, it was obviously the defining moment of that game. Um, and it was actually just just got updates that um, Rashad Jenning um, via Dan Graziano of ESPN.com was told um, – to not score when they were on the Dallas um, five-yard line at the end of the game, their last drive. Um, It's just, it blows my mind because, think about it, you're up 23-20, to okay? A touchdown would put you up 30-20 to with 110 seconds left in the game, okay? And to me, it just makes no sense that you wouldn't do that. They would have to score a touchdown, first of all. So they would have to go the entire length of the field. Tony Romo obviously is capable of doing that. Most but, most game-winning drives since 2006 in the yes. fourth quarter. But Just with, you, with your secondary playing the way they did today, I mean, uh, yesterday, yesterday, they would have to make a successful onside kick, and they would have to score again within that 110-second time span. I just don't see what the Giants did as... As I don't know, I just it was a it was a brain fart to me. <laughs> it was just uh, a total brain fart on the coaching uh, uh, standpoint. A buddy of ours from the Yes Network, you might have heard of him, of him Chris Sheeran. He retweeted this tweet um, a couple hours ago. It's some guy who I guess wrote in his notes section of his iPhone. It says, "On their last drive, excuse me, on their last drive, the Cowboy, the Giants, excuse me, left a combined total of 43 seconds on the clock." by snapping the ball too early on four plays when the game clock was running. 
on those four plays, they had 11, 17, 10, and five seconds left on the play clock. The Giants also cost themselves 12 seconds with the illegal formation penalty. That penalty was at 2 minutes and 12 seconds, which stopped the clock before the two-minute warning and allowed the Cowboys to save a timeout. Now on third and goal, if Eli takes the sack, instead of throwing the ball away, they run another 40 seconds off the clock about, or even if they hand the ball off to Rashad Jennings, they could have even taken the delay of game penalty before the field goal, assuming that's what they did, to add another five yards to the already chip shot just to waste some time. So you do the math. It's 43 seconds from the play clock, 12 seconds from the penalty, and 40 seconds from them passing the ball into the back of the end zone. That's 95 seconds. That's a minute, 35 seconds. That means the Giants failed to burn approximately a minute, 35 of the game clock on their last drive. The Cowboys only had 129 on the game clock when they started their last drive. If the Giants manage the clock well and don't have that dumb penalty on Flowers, the illegal formation, the game's over. The game is over. Absolutely. I mean, the math shows itself. But, you know, it was, you know, the coaching staff not thinking – um, Tom Coughlin thought that the uh, Cowboys ran out of timeouts on that first down when Jennings ran, uh, ran the ball. That wasn't the case. Uh, Eli, going to Eli real quick, not falling down for a sack, which would have wasted more time. He throws the ball in the back of the end zone. You know what's funny? Eli Manning, 12-year vet. Tom Coughlin, been a head coach in the league since 1997. Tom Coughlin and Eli Manning are wizards with the two-minute drill. Yeah. They are wizards with time management, and it just went completely out the window. How many times have we heard today that if Gino did it, yeah. if Mariota did it, if Winston did it, then you would say rookie mistake. But you're a 12-year vet. The rookie mistakes need to go out of the window by your 12th year in the league by now. Yeah, um, it, It's just a complete dismantle of – football fundamentals that happened within one 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 drive one one four four play uh series it just makes no no sense to me as um a football fan because like you said today i would have known to fall down for a sack exactly we have somebody calling in and hello who is this who is this Who is this? Richard. What is it? Is it Cell? Yeah. <laughs> hold on. Do we have? No, it's not Cell. It's not the number. Hold on. Hold on. We know who you are. No, it's Richard. I'm Grandpa. Do you know what it is? Anyway. <laughs> Usually. All right. I thought you. It was a 72 number. Oh well. You hung up on him. That's not me. Anyway. All right. Call back. We apologize. That's Scott's fault. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, so yeah, really bad, really bad clock management, really bad coaching, bad decisions from Eli, but we got to bring this up. None of this is talked about if the defense doesn't completely choke with a minute and whatever, however many seconds are on the clock. The defense played great all game long. And then when it was 23-13, to 13, the Cowboys drove the ball, and that drive was way too easy. That was the first win and touchdown. And then they did the same thing on the Cowboys' last drive. Lance Dunbar had 41 yards in two plays. Lance Dunbar on little, little passes right out in front of yeah. him. And <laughs> it's like, go ahead, here's, here, here's the lane, just walk. Go ahead. That, that's basically what I saw from a, a team that was performing so well, so well, and everyone was stunned at how uh, the secondary held up against uh, Des Bryant and that that whole the whole crew um, stripping uh, Cole Beasley, who's a very protective um, uh, wide receiver. Jermaine McBride played a huge game. Dominic Rogers, Cromartie, Prince McMore, they all played great games, and just when it, you wanted them to perform the most in the clutch moments 
you know, the two minutes make anything, NBA, NFL, just the, the final minutes you got to produce. you got to say, I'm going to step up, I'm going to come in the clutch, and I'm going to stop this drive. And it was just the complete opposite. All right, hold on. He's calling in again. All right, who is this? <laughs> Hello? Younger. All right, whatever. All right. <laughs> Over two. Over two. Third time's a charm if you feel like calling back. Uh, the number, we want to talk to you guys, so call in 201-825-1234. That's the number, 201-825-1234. By the way, if you call in, make sure your radio is turned down because it screws up with uh, the transmitter a little bit. So if you're going to call in, turn your radio down because we can't hear our voices through the headphones, and that's a little annoying, and then it messes up our transmission. Uh, but anyway... I want to throw back to Super Bowl 46. Ahmad Bradshaw gets the handoff. Tries to go down, doesn't, falls into the end zone touchdown. Why didn't that happen last night? You want to waste as much time as possible. And if you throw the ball, I mean, don't get me wrong. Going for the two-point pos- two possession game is not a bad idea. But it's a bad idea when nobody is open. If someone's wide open in the end zone and you want to go and you want to get ahead by 10 points, then you throw the ball. Nobody was open. No, um, no one was open. And, well, D- Daniel Fells, they were saying uh, if he even threw the ball in his way, he was being held so bad in the end badly. zone. Badly. Badly. He couldn't even get off of the uh, defender. Um, so even if Eli put it over there. I mean, obviously, you know, he was scrambling a little bit. Maybe he wasn't paying attention, but I don't know. There, there were just so many things that that went wrong on that uh, on that uh, drive, and it just it it just baffles me that something so simple as running a clock, <coughs> something so simple as running a clock, cannot be performed by two guys um, and a coaching staff that are veterans and have you know the mindset of. I'm going to win, win this game, and clock management is winning a game. And this is a huge, huge game, Ryan, and you know that because this could come down to being the Giants might not win the, the East if it comes down to them having a good season because the Cowboys beat them week one. You know, it's just a bad way to start off. This is the stuff you get away in preseason. This is the real deal, and they just, you know, they, they choke. It's funny how we're saying this is the loss where – you where it comes down to the division lead, and we both called that the Cowboys would win the game. Yeah. But predictions go completely out the window when you have the game won and then you literally let it slip right through your fingers. Literally let it slip right through. This is up there with this, uh, the Seahawks not giving Lynch the ball. It's, it's right up there. Yeah. And even that, and honestly, this is a worse play call than that. I'm going to be honest, because the Seahawks wanted to be aggressive. Marshawn Lynch, we saw it yesterday. He could not get the one yard in overtime. So, I mean, that's obviously one play. Who knows if Lynch would have gotten the yard. But in all seriousness, this was – I usually don't blame football games on coaching, and especially with Tom Coughlin, because Tom Coughlin is a wizard when it comes to time management. He blew it. He blew it. McAdoo blew it. Eli blew it. It's all three of their faults. And and what I want to get into right now is what is the order of blame from one being the most blamed to three being the least? Uh, we're talking about – you're talking about Coughlin, McAdoo. Coughlin, McAdoo. And then, well, defense. All right. You know what? I'm not talking about, about McAdoo because McAdoo, yes, he called the play, but it ran through Coughlin. So Coughlin obviously had to advise and say, yes, right. this is the play we're going to go with. Rashad, try not to score. Right. Okay? I think, one, I think it mostly falls on Eli. Because Eli needs to understand that, okay, the play they call, this is what happened. But you need to know there is a clock in front of your face that is counting down. You're snapping it at 11. You're snapping it at 17. Why are you so anxious? Kill the clock. You're up by, up by three. You're at least going to be up by six, which means they have to score a touchdown. Drop the clock. But no, he he 
snap the ball real quick. I think it falls on him. And then at the end, with the whole not falling for a sack, even. Like, it's just, I think, number one, it falls on Eli. I think this this falls on Eli, and he um, said in the press, uh, press conference, I got to know that. I got to know that I have to fall for the sack. But you also know that you were snapping the ball way too early. Yeah. It, I wanted to see that clock at either two or one when you're snapping the ball. And, I, th- I think and, I think, and Coughlin and McAdoo are not telling him snap the ball at ten seconds. No, snap that, the that, ball. That, that's that's, that's all on Eli. Yeah. So you make a great point when you talk about the entire drive. When you want to talk about the entire the entire drive, then yes, you put most of the blame on Eli for not knowing how much clock is left or lack thereof. But when you talk about the play in general. It's it's going to be referred to as the play in giant. We have the yeah, catch, we have the helmet yeah. catch, and then we have the the <laughs> the play that hopefully doesn't get them out of the playoffs. Yeah, exactly. But what was I, just, I? I lost my target ball for a second. Coughlin or McAdoo or both. Someone needs to tell. Should Eli know to take the sack or to give the ball to Jennings or whatever? He of course should know that, but. The coaches can't not tell him that. The coaches can't assume that he knows that. Yeah. As a coach, you have to remind your players of the situation. That's what the coaches are for. And Tom Coughlin's very good at that, analyzing the situation. How many times do we see him on the sideline going absolutely ballistic <laughs> on someone? Because he knows the play. He has to analyze the play. And someone didn't tell Eli what to do. At least that's what I'm assuming. And Eli hasn't said anything besi- um, anything to – what's the word I'm looking for? Anything to go against that. Yeah. So blame goes on Coffin for that play. But if you want to talk about the entire drive in general, then you make a really good point with Eli. Again, snapping the ball with 11 seconds, 10 seconds, yeah. 17 – snapping the ball at 17 seconds left in the play clock – what is it? The twenty? What are you? Didn't he rush the offense at one point? Did he? I, I mean, I don't know. But what? What's play clock? Thirty-five. Forty. Forty. Okay. So yeah, even seventeen seconds. That's a normal play. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't get it. I, I think it falls on Eli most. Like I, I can understand where Coughlin is coming from. I, I really do. Like, he, if you don't want him to score. I mean, you are killing killing the clock either way. And Eli just did a poor uh, performance with that play call. But why do they have to try to score with a pass? You know that if it's incomplete, the clock stops. Exactly. And even if they do score, they still have a minute 40 left on the clock to score two touchdowns. We saw Romo score a touchdown in 90 seconds, if that. So you know that if they wind up getting the outside kick, then they would have solid field goal pos- field position. At the 40, and then they would only need a field goal anyway, so a quick 15-yard out route, you're in field goal range. So why not run the ball? Run the ball. Obviously, we're stating the obvious. You've heard of this all day, but it, 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 it baffles me. Why did you have to try to score throwing the ball? If you don't score on a run, unless you go out of bounds, the clock stops because odds are on a three-yard carry, if that, you're staying in bounds. On a pass, if it's incomplete, the clock is stopping, and there's no there's no excuses yeah, whatsoever. You run the ball, you don't score, waste the clock, take the delay of game. You have four; they have 45 seconds left on the clock. And you know what? As soon as I saw Eli, because it was a play action, I saw him look for Jennings, and I was like, "All right, sweet, good idea. Waste the clock, even if you don't score, good plan." And then I see him hold on to the ball. And as, as soon as he held on to the ball, me, my dad, and my brother were watching the game. We all said, we all said that the Cowboys were going to drive the football because you know Tony Romo was capable of that, and you know that's a huge momentum swing right away because right away Dallas is saying, okay, we're going to try to take advantage of the mistakes, and Dallas Especially did just that. Especially at AT&T Stadium, too. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you have your fans backing you after that. Uh, I mean... I don't know. It's like running a marathon, and the final ten feet, you just start walking. Like they, that's what that's what it felt like to me. They were playing so hard, and everything was was just starting to click, and then right at the end, they just nonchalantly forgot to play the game of football. 
in my, opi- in my, in my opinion. Like I said, I don't usually blame a giant game on coaching, but this one, you have to at some point. Yeah. Two touchdowns should not have scored. The last one, obviously, and the penalty on Dominique Rogers Kamari on third down. everyone said, even Mike Pereira, the, um, the referee correspondent for um, NBC, said that wasn't a penalty. That's the normal pushing and shoving of a receiver. And, and he and didn't even court. push and shove. No, he just had his hands there. Barely. What, what was it called, that, that he pushed his shoulder back? And I didn't see any. Th- I didn't see any part of his upper body move. If any, if anything, the receiver kind of pushed off of him at the end. I am. I follow a lot of Cowboy fans on Twitter because I'm friends with a lot of them. They said two things. When the penalty happened, they all said that's not a penalty. And then when they scored the next play, you know we know Cowboy fans. They will weed them boys. How about them Cowboys? It's all they do when they win. But as soon as they scored that touchdown after that penalty. Not one person celebrated because they knew they didn't deserve it. Yeah, um, you know, it just—I don't know. It, it worked at the end of the day. It worked out in the Cowboys' favor, but it wasn't just the penalty. It was you got to blame that on that last two minutes. It's just—it's awful. Coming from two Giants fans, this is this is pretty bad. And don't and and to the other Giants fans, don't say this is just Week One. That is your that is your head coach making a dumb decision, and your quarterback making an even dumber decision through that series. That's something that should be gone in preseason. That's something that we need to worry about if that's the case for the rest of the season. Don't say it's just week one. And the week one excuse has to go when you're Absolutely. a twelve year veteran and you've been coaching for almost twenty years. No. It has to. There's no week one excuse in a division game against your biggest rival. That shouldn't happen. You can't call for a week one excuse when you know what you're supposed to be doing as a fan. If you're a fan saying, why didn't they run the ball, don't give them the it's week one excuse. Exactly. Because if you know, they definitely know. <laughs> but uh, again, and now we gotta now we gotta talk about the defense. Played very well all game long. All game long. And then what we saw the final two drives. I expected that for literally the entire game. They were they were a sieve. I thought it was going to happen in, in the first first quarter, maybe in, in the um, maybe even the whole first half. Actually, we, we were talking about it, but in a situation like that, when we see um, just 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 woeful defense, just every single play, it's like um, you were just letting the receivers make a catch. Hopefully that. Hopefully, praying that the clock would go out. I I just I just don't understand. And, and I mean, I, I said this today to uh, George actually. Um, you gotta know Jason Witten's running a curl on the goal line. Yeah. You gotta know that Des Bryant out of the game. Who's Tony Romo gonna go to? When you have one person on him. A rookie linebacker. A rookie linebacker on Jason Witten. I'm sorry, but that's just. That's a piece of cake for Tony Romo and Jason Wade. And that's on Spags. I mean, I like Spags a lot. And I hate to say that he has no help with defense, but you still got to know you can't put an inside linebacker, rookie inside yeah. linebacker, on Jason Wynn. You double-team Jason Wynn. You know he's going to throw to him. I-, I would take any other chance on a one-on-one with any, uh, any other receiver. Cole Bleasy, fine, one-on-one. Jason Witten, with the game on the line, you know he's going to throw him the ball. Hall, he's a Hall of Famer. He's a Hall of Famer. You're putting a rookie on him. I, I commend Jason Witten. I love Jason Witten. Yep. But you know what? You got to know that's going to happen. And I don't know. It, just all, it, it all fell apart when you needed it to, you know, hold up. Just just for a minute, minute and a half. You would think the defense would be like, okay, they made a mistake. We have to shut this down. Nope. Not, not, not the case at all. And I want to commend Tony Romo also. I mean, what a drive he put up. Oh, yeah. The, the hate for Tony Romo has got to stop. Yeah, he was quick. He knew exactly what he needed to do. The minute he got that, that chance, he was like, okay, this is what we're going to do, and he executed it to a T. To a T. He's on the uh, – you know, I hate – like, as soon as the Giants lost, this has happened. The, the Cowboys have won the last five meetings between the Cowboys and Giants. Yeah. So that means for the last five times they've played each other, you have all the Giant fans after the game going, Tony Romo has – 
two playoff wins. Eli has two Super Bowls, so it doesn't even matter. All right, Eli Manning has two Super Bowls. Tony Romo has two playoff wins. I guess the Giants are 1-0 and now, and the Cowboys are all one right? Yeah. Uh, let, let it go. You lost, let it go. It doesn't matter anymore. Stop talking about the past. Yeah, let it go. That's what they're just going to have to do. I mean, yes, they made a mistake. They understand that, but let's... I'm definitely going to see the Giants, I think, coming out um, bare knuckles into um, uh, against the Falcons next week. And they're, oh, I hope so. They're going to, I, I hopefully, yeah, exactly, you hope so, going to make a statement, ho- hopefully, that they made a mistake and they're moving from it. Because, again, you can't dwell, dwell on the past. Yes, um, it was an issue, but, you know, it's done. It's over with. Everyone understands that they were wrong and move on. We're moving uh, football teams going to the best football team in New York record-wise, the New York Jets. Beat the Cleveland Browns 31-10. to Ryan Fitzpatrick, uh, pretty impressive New York Jets debut, I'd say. He threw 174 yeah. yards, uh, two touchdowns, an interception. Was that interception the one that he threw and then Marshall yes. fumbled? So that's the interception. I think, yeah. Um, yeah, the Jets played a great game yesterday. Um, it, they were a little shaky to start off, but they they found their rhythm and they they were uh, good on both sides of the ball. And R- R- Ryan Fitz- uh, Fitzpatrick, in my opinion, did a very good job with that team yesterday. Josh McCown got laid <laughs> out. He hey. looked like. Hold on, we we have it. Where is it? I don't know what button it is. Hold on, uh, it's somewhere over here. Where is it? It's a helicopter. Oh, here we go. Helicopter. This is Josh McCown after he got laid out. <laughs> a man laid did a full 360 out. in the air. Um, yeah, Josh McCown. And then that we was, saw that was bad. We saw God's gift, Johnny Football. Yeah, you know how we both feel about him. Breaking news. I'm, I mean, I'm, Johnny Football. Yeah, he Johnny had football one. He, he had one. He had one good good play through a nice 54 50, yard. Throw. That, yeah, that was a nice. Play. That, was, that was an awesome that was throw. Nice play. But at the end of the day, Jets defense prevailed. Uh, Jets offense most certainly prevailed. Brandon Marshall having a great game. Brandon Marshall did a very good game. And Chris Ivory, what a day. What a day. Oh, I think yeah. 90, I... 91 yards on 20 carries, two touchdowns. I hope my dad is listening to this because I almost hung up on him. My, <laughs> me, my brother, my dad, we do, a, we do a fantasy league. Okay. Last year, who did he pick last year? He picked someone ahead of Frank. Like I said, Frank Gore is going to be good, and he didn't pick him for like five rounds. And then he, I can't remember who he picked. I hung up on him. I literally hung up on him, and we missed the playoffs. We missed the playoffs because he didn't pick who I wanted to pick. And this year I hung up on him again because he picked Chris Ivory. But let, yesterday, Chris Ivory proved me wrong. He played very well. He was a bull. He averaged over four yards of carry. And that's what the Jets need, especially right now. If they don't have a quarterback situation, you're going to have to rely on Chris Ivory a lot this year. 90 yards in game one. Sure, it's Cleveland. Cleveland does have a pretty good defense, though. Yeah. They're high in fantasy rankings. So good for Chris Ivory. And the Jets played a pretty good game yesterday. Yeah, um, actually, honestly, I think Chris Ivory could have had more than 100 yards. Uh, they brought in Powell a lot. Um, but he made the best of his situation, Tw- uh, 20 carries, 91 yards, two TDs. Fantasy owners are a lot happy. A buddy of mine, Augie, at Augie Sports, go follow him on Twitter. He just t- he tweeted to me, 68 yards by Chris Ivory came after contact. Jeez. And that, that uh, the Jets are not used to seeing, in my opinion. No. I think he gets knocked down at the line, and you know, it shows. Chris Ivory, again, as the Giants didn't step up, the Jets stepped up. Chris Ivory stepped up. Um, yesterday, and we're, I think we're definitely going to see that throughout the season. I like what I saw out of Brandon Marshall yesterday. A lot of toughness on that interception. Ooh. He Ooh. literally stripped, I forgot who intercepted it, but he stripped it out of the defender's hands. He is happy to be a Jet. He wants to win. He has very high expectations for this team, and he liked Geno Smith a lot. Obviously, he's down with the jaw injury after the fight in the preseason. But Brandon Marshall is high on this football team, and he wants to win, and he proved it right there. And he even had a good game. Six catches, 62 yards, a touchdown. Nice day by Brandon Marshall. Yeah, a lot of people said that um, 
his trip on uh, t- it was t- uh, Tayshawn G- uh, Gibson mm-hmm. intercept the ball from Fitzpatrick yesterday. But they said that was the game's turning point. They were down 7-0, uh, 10 minutes left to play in the second quarter. Uh, Fitzpatrick was picked off. Everyone's like, oh, here we go. Here we go already. Um, but, you know, Marshall made a great play. Uh, and then they returned to um, – what they returned the ball to? Cleveland's 11-yard yeah, line. So much So that. they set up perfectly. Two, two plays later, scored, game tied. Jets talk. Make sure you call 201-825-1234. Beasts of the East, Ryan Mark and Scott Thompson on WRPR 90.3 FM. The bad news about the Jets, though, Antonio Camardi – down with the sprained knee. Well, bit, and bittersweet because it looked real bad. Yeah. Everyone thought ACL, MCL, meniscus, whatever bad. else you could think of with, with a knee. And luckily it is uh, just just sprained. Um, he is week to week right now. He's not, they say he's not ruled out for next for week. For next week, yeah, no. Um, so. Oh, by the way, the Colts were terrible yesterday. Oh, God, <laughs> awful. Rex- I mean, Buffalo played... Buffalo played a great game. Told you yesterday. they'd be rejuvenated with Rex Ryan there. Oh, absolutely! But I was surprised. I mean, I know, like the Colts. They're supposed to have one of the top offenses in the league, and they were bad. Yeah, real bad. I mean, what happened yesterday? I don't know. T. Y. Hilton got hurt. He might be week to week. They're saying he might miss a game or two. And Sean McCoy didn't even have a good game. Uh, did he have a touchdown? I don't remember. 41 yards, 2.4 averaging. That's it. Wow. Nothing. Yeah, Bills played a really good game yesterday. They're, they're a good team. Every to, every team in that division is very good. They all yeah. have a very like, – the Patriots probably have the worst defense in that division. They still have the best offense, which yeah, – which, which gets them out of every single mishap they might have. Pretty much. But Buffalo's defense is incredible. The Dolphins have an incredible front, front four. We already know about the New York Jets defense. Buffalo played a really good game yesterday, and I was surprised that the Colts got absolutely manhandled. Yeah. So, week one predictions. I was, me, you, and George were both eight. We're all eight and four. Eight and Brandon six. was uh, eight and six. Brandon was ten and four. So, we got I don't, two I, games tonight. I don't even remember who I picked. I have to look at that paper. I think everyone picked Eagles Vikings except for you. I picked, I picked Falcons. You said, I think you said Falcons. Vikings. I picked Falcons Vikings. So we'll see what happens with that. Want to go bold predictions for tonight? Bold predictions? Bold predictions for Who's tonight. Who's my key player tonight? Yeah. Both games. Both games. Um I think my key player definitely for the first game, the Eagles Falcons game, is gonna be DeMarco Murray. I think um if you want someone to make a statement about, you know, letting him go and getting picked up and you know, making a new out of something that he Never, I, I, in my opinion, I never saw this coming at all. I thought Jerry Jones would give his left leg for DeMarco Murray after yeah. the season last year. Yeah. But I think he's going to have a great game tonight against the Falcons defense, who's a little iffy to me. Um, Their offense is incredible, though. Yeah, my definitely my breakout player tonight is going to be DeMarco Murray. Adrian Peterson, ready for this? Anita Marks said that. And Adrian Peters would, would rush for 2,500 yards. And I don't doubt it at all. Really? I really don't. I don't. I. 2,500? This man's on a mission. 25! Hey, listen. I, I think after everything that's happened to him, Adrian Peterson, in my opinion, still is the best running back in the game right now. You just, I just saw that calculator. Well, what does he have to rush every game? 156.25 yards a game. There's no way. You know what? Stop. Hold on. I'll say yes, you say no. I do. He was going to have to rush for 156 yards a game if he wants to get to 2,500. He's not going to get to 2,500, but I'll tell you this. Adrian Peterson is going to rush for over 175 yards tonight against the 49ers. Yeah. The 49ers defensive line is terrible. They lost everybody. They yeah. lost everybody. It's like they'll just lose. Got up and said bye. Basically. Um, who was that, Patrick Willis? Just Patrick Willis retired. retired. Chris Baldwin retired. Justin Smith retired. Alden Smith uh, is in jail. Raiders, 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 Raiders. So jail, yeah. 
Um, that was all. Oh. Rich just got a quick update. Um, Giants QB Eli Manning admits he he did tell Rashad Jennings not to score on the two run plays inside the Dallas five uh, yesterday. So that's both from Jennings and Eli saying that that was. The I don't case. get. Don't they? There are clocks all over the place. There are clocks all over the place, and they couldn't see. All right, we're past that. <laughs> I don't get. No, I don't get it. There are clocks all over the place, and oh my god, this is what Eli's saying right now. I'm legally blind. There you go, Eli's <laughs> legally blind. I'm legally blind. What are you doing? It's six thirty-five. We talked a lot. <laughs> we did talk a lot because the Giants are a joke. Yeah. Giants are a flat-out joke. But you know what? All day time. Here's Scotty T with the updates. All right, we got a Ramapo updates. Uh, women's volleyball. Saturday sweep beat Karen University three sets to none, winning the sets with a combined score of 75 to 15, an absolute blowout. A few hours later, they played Emmanuel College three sets to none. Ramapo hitting percentage at 571 against Karen, uh, 192 against Emmanuel. Larissa Iwiskew with 22 kills on the day, seven aces against Emmanuel. Emily Harris with 20, 26 digs on the day. Caitlin McIver with 33 assists, 25 against Emmanuel. Uh, the team moves to 2-1 and one overall. Back in action on Wednesday as they take on Mount St. Mary's College at the Bradley Center at 7 p.m. On to women's soccer. Women's soccer, there we go. Took down Cent- uh, Centenary College 3-1 to one yesterday. They moved to 4-0 and oh on the season. Skyler Ray Backey with two goals. Back in action on Wednesday when they traveled to Drew University. On to men's soccer, they unfortunately lost their first game of the year on Saturday when Eastern Connecticut shut them out 4 nothing. Now 3-1-1, one, one. they are back in action Wednesday when they travel to Arcadia University. Women's field hockey lost to Marywood University on Saturday, 3-1. Melissa Choka with the lone Ramapo goal. They are back in action tomorrow against St. Thomas Aquinas College here at Ramapo. Women's tennis, they took on St. St. Thomas Aquinas today. I should have so see how that goes. I should have. Uh, I should have given you that update. What they won? I have no idea. I actually should have checked before the show. Oh, jeez. Well, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll we'll let look you it know. up and we'll let you know. All right, on to pro updates. Again, Giants lost a heartbreaker last night. Up ten with eight minutes to go. Then up three with over one thirty left. They elect not to run it. Make it uh, 26 to 20 with a minute and 30 left, and the Cowboys quarterback Tony Romo took his team down the field, and then this happened. Yep, Cowboys won it 27 26, outgaining the Giants in yards 436 to 289. The Giants will play the Falcons next week, though, at MetLife Stadium, and the Cowboys have another division game in Philly next week. On the other side of the ball, the Jets are 1-0. and They beat uh, the Cleveland Browns 31-10. to Chris Ivory, 91 yards and two TDs on 20 carries. Brandon Marshall, six catches for 62 yards and a touchdown. Uh, bad and good news, kind of. Antonio Camardi did leave the game, but it turns out he only had a sprained knee. He's listed week to week. Not ruled out for next week's game against the Colts on Monday night. Um, Lorenzo Mullen uh, left the hospital earlier today. He suffered a concussion. However, he has no neck injury. Monday night football, first of the week. Eagles at Falcons tonight at 7, followed by the Vikings and 49ers at 10.30. So tune in to ESPN for that. Uh, the Yankees lost 3 of 4 to the Blue Jays on the weekend, which was not a good job for them. They won the lone game of the series yesterday, 5 0, though. Tanaka with seven innings of shutout ball, seven Ks, four hits. Dustin Ackley with a two run homer. The Yankees will start a crucial nine game road trip tonight in St. Petersburg to play the Tampa Bay Rays. CC Sabathia, Erasmo Ramirez on the bump tonight. First pitch is at 7 10. Uh, the Mets won their seventh game in a row yesterday by sweeping Atlanta in four games. Uh, they scored five plus in all games of their current win streak. Yesterday, Daniel Murphy tied the game with a 3-1 home run with two outs in the top of the ninth. He scored three more in the top of the tenth. They are now up nine and a half games in the division. Their magic number is 11 wins. Uh, They start a three-game series in Queens tonight against the Marlins. Tonight, it's Logan Verrett versus Justin Nicolino. On to the U.S. Open, Novak Djokovic defeated Roger Federer in four sets yesterday to win. This is his third major victory of the year. Djokovic having a great year. And, yeah, that's it. It's a lot.
We'll be right back after these messages. Peace of the East on WRPR. We'll be right back. What song should I put on? House Party. Same one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, by the way, that was uh, out. You knew that? What? That was out of the clothing. That was who? Cool. It, it was? Yeah. It, was? Swear my life. it wasn't his number. It doesn't matter. I know he knows his number. So go to the Yeah. I knew it was him. And now he's trying. Yeah, he, goes, he goes, I haven't called him yet. What are you saying? He's like trying to say a little bit. Why did we ever pause this while we do the commercials? I don't know. We sh- I should have. Do you know how to edit that out? I just talk shit I about do. That. I just I talk shit like about Cella. And... Yeah, that's Cella. Uh, hope you're alright. Oh, the mics are on. Hey, guys. <laughs> we'll be alright. Don't worry. Beast of the East. We screwed that one up, didn't we? We really screwed that one up, huh? Oh, well. We'll be all right. Yeah. Peace to the East, Ryan Morgan, Scott Thompson. If you want to be a homebody. I'm really embarrassed. That's probably the worst screw-up I've had so far. I know, well, it happens to the best of us. All right. Let's get to baseball, right? Uh, sorry you guys had to hear that. You hear that, Stella? Anyway. <laughs> Let's talk about the Mets, man. We'll be all right. All right. So the New York Mets... They have won seven in a row. All of those wins by five plus. They've had five plus runs. They and don't every know single game during that win streak. Yeah. yeah, they do not know how to lose. And I saw an incredible stat the other day. Go ahead. The Nationals have less of a chance of making the postseason, despite their seventy-two and seventy record, than the Boston Red Sox. Who are in last place in the American League? You're serious? Yes. <laughs> wow. Wow. And the Nationals are nine and a half games out of the NL East. They are, I don't know how many games out in the uh, wild card. It, it, I know it's double digits. Yeah. yeah. Let me find it real quick. The Mets, they, they don't know how to lose, they know how to win, and they want to win. They have their true identity. We talked about this the other day. The Yankees don't have their true identity. The Mets do. Yeah, the Nationals are uh, 10 games back in the wild card. 10 games back in the wild card. I think the Red Sox are... The Red Sox are 7. <laughs> it's a joke. Anyway. Yeah, the Mets are having... I think they're having the, the season of their lives right now. This is so rejuvenating for Mets fans. Because they're usually used to dwelling on the past and... You know, maybe next season. You know, uh, uh, saying maybe next season. Maybe next season. Who knows? But no, it's it's this season. This is next season this, for them. This is now, right now. And Terry Collins, smiling on the bench. Oh yeah. We're not used to that, but um, yeah. Coming from a family who was half Mets, half Yankees, uh, we're definitely hearing it right now from the other half, because the Mets, in my opinion, are the best team in New York right now. No, I said it. Without a doubt. Without a doubt, the Mets are a much better team than the New York Yankees. They're running away with this. The, the, legit running away. They, they can't lose. Even when they were down against the Braves, you knew, uh-oh. It is the Braves. I mean, yeah. But you knew but the Mets were going to find a way to come back. The Mets clinched their first season, their first 500 season for the first time since 2008, I believe. And they can clinch the NLDS and possibly get home field advantage? When was the last time that happened? They are a half a game behind the L.A. Dodgers. The Mets are 82-61. and 61. The Dodgers are 82-60. and 60. Would you want, in a five-game set, would you want home field advantage or no? Five-game set, 2-2-1. Two, 2-2-1, two, one. Two, two, one. yes. Why? Why? I don't know. I, I I just think that home field advantage is just it. It's just such a definitive factor to me. 
Uh, I mean, a lot of people look at it as, it's just a game. They're, they're playing, yeah, I get that it's home, I get that it's away. But it's just such a definitive but, factor to me. But is it really home? You have to, here's how I look at it, with the whole, with all the formats, the 2-2-1, two, two, the 2-3-2. Two, two, you need to decide, in a 2-2-1 in a two, two, series, how often, how long do those series usually last? I'd say if you want to average it, probably four. There's my point. You, I think you would want game four at your home field. No. No to me, though. No, because... Because you can, you can obviously get game five yeah, on but, your own home but field. But to me, the Mets fans this year are selling out City Field every right. single postseason game. Right. So that I don't see them. If they're going to get home field advantage, I think these young kids are going to be pumped up and... Those two games are going to be highly, highly in favor of the Mets because they're going to have such a backing in this postseason. There's going to be every single T-shirt you can think of being made. You're going to see just so much Mets pride, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout the um, the postseason. And to me, I, I feel like those first two games, if they get home field advantage, would be absolutely awesome. But on the other side, if they don't get home field advantage, I can definitely see them, like you said maybe winning one on the road and coming back and finishing it at City Field. I just think City Field this year, I mean, this postseason is going to be rocking. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. They haven't made the postseason since 2006. They're selling out every game. It's not even October yet. We need postseason baseball back in Queens. Postseason baseball back in Queens. Who thought we'd be saying that? The best things to happen to this sport in a really, really long time. The, Je- the Yankees and Mets, both. Yeah. The Yankees haven't made the, the postseason since 2012. There's a chance at another Subway series. I would love that. Small chance, but... The Yankees just got to start playing. Well, we'll get to the yeah. Yankees in a couple minutes. But real quick, I want to talk about Matt Harvey. Again? Again, because they just came out with um, the news that they're not going to skip a lot of his starts. They're just going to shorten a lot of them. So basically what they would be doing in the postseason. Right. I like it. Can I tell you why I like it? Please, if you can convince me. Their bullpen. is awful. Their bullpen also gets a chance to see what they will be facing in the postseason. But the bullpen is bad. But that the, doesn't matter. I understand it might be bad. Yes, Tyler Clippard and Familia are putting in good innings, but other than that, it's almost, it's, like, it's almost like the Yankees. Patances and Miller are putting in good innings, but other than that, we have a little bit of an issue. But if they can understand, if they can get a feel for, okay, Matt's going to go a max, five and two-thirds, six, we need to step up. We need to help our team win. So if you're going to ease them into that, I like it. I do. But, again, we can't be pitching Tyler Clippard and, Batan- um, Batan- Tyler Clippard and Familia, I mean, every, every single night. Do you really want to do that? I mean, you kind of have to, right? But then the more they throw, they're going to be exhausted. Look at exactly. look at look at what happened with Batantis and Miller. Batantis, the game that we went to, he was getting he was being used a lot by Girardi, and he almost blew that game. They were up three runs. He walked three people, and the bases were loaded. He's lucky he got out of that inning. Yeah. If you overwork if you overwork the bullpen, that's already bad. It's not good. This is a bad bullpen, and if they're you, if you're gonna rely on them for four or five plus innings for the rest of the season, the nine and a half game lead is gonna be safe. But then you're you're looking at the division series against most likely the Dodgers, and and you know you have no shot bear because down. the bullpen's gonna blow it. You gotta bear down. The bullpen has to understand that they are gonna be an extremely definitive factor in the postseason. And they need to bear down, and they need to pick their pants up, put on their belt, put on their glove, and pitch. Pitch what you're supposed to be there. You're there for, for just that. You pitch. You're on the but mound. But they can't pitch. They're going to have to. I understand you're saying can't, but you got to look at it optimistically. Matt's going to put in this. No Met fan looks at anything optimistically. Are you I kidding know. me? They have a nine and a half game lead, and people are still saying they're going to blow it. Be an optimistic sports radio Talk show host. I am. Or me. No, you you're know, not. I am never pessimistic. Are you kidding me? You just said they, they're really bad. 
They are really bad. That's not being pessimistic. That's just stating facts. They're bad. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, bear down, pitch, do your job. Good luck. Good luck, Mets, because if Harvey's throwing five innings, you're, you're done. Good you're luck, done. Mets, because... Wait till next year. We're bringing back the same, because the bullpen's throwing for four no. or five innings. They can't throw. Harvey needs to throw. He needs to, but he's not going to. We already, we already established this. <laughs> we did already establish We did. Let's go to the other side. Let's go to the other borough. Other side. I want to go to sleep. I'm exhausted. Anyway, let's go to the other borough. The Yankees with a god, god awful series against the Blue Jays. Ryan, please, please, please tell me they're going to at least make the playoffs. They're going to. All right. You, wow. You are a hypocrite. I'm, so, Ryan, I'm sorry. Ryan, be an optimistic radio <laughs> dog. Just, just, I'm, just, <laughs> you high key. You're high key a hypocrite. Yeah, whatever. But yeah, all right. Anyway, Yankees, biggest series in years. Probably three years. Their biggest series. Mm-hmm. And they lost three out of four at home. One of them. On September the 11th, I thought that game was going to be a huge momentum swing, and here's why. September 11th, obviously a day where uh, the entire country is rooting for one another. Yank- and obviously the Yankees are at home. So you know the crowd is going to be wild. And then they're playing Toronto, which is a country versus country game. I know, stating the obvious. But it's, it's a com- that game right there is the game that they should have won. And what was Severino did not pitch well at all. And that set the tone for the entire series. And then you go into the doubleheader. You, let's be real. We heard it on the Michael K show before. Joe Girardi did not manage very well at all. No. At one point, it was 5-4, to four, bottom of the eighth. Uh, man on first and th- second. Ellsbury and Garner at first and second. Wild pitch. Ellsbury takes third. Gardner doesn't take first. Whether he got, I was listening to it on the radio, so I'm not sure if he got a bad read or not. But that happened. So first and third. Why isn't Brett Gardner stealing? Probably because Cecil's on the mound and he's a lefty. But then he gets in a rundown. Send Ellsbury. Then and go the, go the old school way. You have Brian McCann up, and then he winds up getting a single, ties it up. If Gardner's on second. He scores. He that's scores. Either. That's the game-winning run. The Yankees yeah. win, and then that sets the tone for the second game in the doubleheader. Because who knows what would have happened if the Yankees won the first game of the doubleheader? Because the Yankees went into the game eleven innings, rain delay. They Chase and Shreve and Brian Mitchell walked twenty-five guys in the top of the eleventh oh, inning. Let's and not even talk about that. And that set the tone right there for the second game. And they didn't play the second game very well at all. The only bright spot of this series was Masahiro Tanaka, who has proven that he can be an ace, and when the Yankees need him, he can throw. Yeah. That's the only bright spot the Yankees had all weekend. But at that point, it didn't matter because those three, those three losses were such a travesty to their chance of trying to at least pick up the division. And I don't know, it was just, again, it was a, a woeful... A team, a team that didn't show me that they wanted it. You know, just simple, just simple um, not performing. Again, like you said, Mitchell and Streep, not, not being able to find the strike zone. Again, you come in for an inning or two max, find the strike zone. Yeah, I know Streep couldn't, couldn't throw a ball down the middle, save his life, honestly. And you know what? Going back to the bad managing by Joe Girardi, I've been a huge fan of Joe Girardi. All season, especially for, for trying to make the best of what he has with him. And he's done a very good job along with his coaching staff. I think he's a binder guy. We all know he's a st- he oh, loves yeah. the stats. He loves his binder. But I think he's managed the bullpen very well up until the last couple of games. I don't think Batanza should have came in the game yesterday. They're winning 4 nothing. But that's but Girardi has no trust in anyone, anyone yeah. except Intensis and Miller. It's al- it's almost like the Mets, you know. The Terry Collins, yes, the Mets are on the street. But and- Justin Wilson and Chase and Shreve, sure. They, all right, they're in a rough spot right now. But Chase and Shreve has been dominant all year. Justin Shreve has a strikeout 
machine. I think he's averaging a strikeout an inning. They've been very good. But now, Batances threw yesterday. He threw the first game of the doubleheader. First game in a new series at Tampa Bay tonight. He's not available. So And, the, and you have CeCe Sabathia starting tonight. He's a five-inning guy. So now you got to rely on Chase and Shreve and Justin Wilson, probably Adam Warren, for three or four innings until um, Andrew Miller can come in. Yeah. So you don't have Dylan Patances tonight. You almost didn't have Andrew Miller tonight because he was warming up yesterday, which is ridiculous. <laughs> Four nothing ball. See, that's that's Girardi's problem. If he sees a lead slipping at any point, Miller he will bring in Patances and Miller. I remember against Boston, they were winning thirteen to eight. And he brought in Batances because it was went from thirteen to three to thirteen to eight, and Girardi was in panic mode. Yeah. He's usually very good with the bullpen, but when he sees a lead slipping, you could be up six runs, and he doesn't trust anyone except Batances and Miller. And now you don't have Batances tonight, and CC is going to throw five innings. Okay. Well, you know what? It just it comes down to what are you going to do to put together a win each night to make sure that you solidify a spot in the playoffs. Yeah. Beast of the East from Studio A around Pocazzo, New Jersey, Mawa, New Jersey on WRPR 90.3 FM. Ryan Warwick and Scotty T. Scotty Thompson, we are the Beast of the East. We'll be right back with our Beast of the Week. But first, some messages. All right, it's time for Beast of the East. No, it's time for the Beast of the Week Duh. on Beast of the East. There we go. Ryan, who you got? I'm going with my boy Tyler Eifert, obviously. Tight end, Cincinnati Bengals, 104 yards, two touchdowns. He got me 36 fancy points. Tyler Eifert, congratulations. I know you're listening. You are my <laughs> Beast of the Week. Sky to see what you got. Um, even though they lost in their game against the Green Bay Packers, Matt Forte had a great game, and that's why he's my Beast of the Week. 141 yards on 24 attempts, one touchdown, and averaging basically six uh, yards carry. Matt Forte, always a prolific runner. Too bad Matt Forte can't stop me in fantasy. I'm going 4-0 nope. this week. Ladies and gentlemen, we are the Beast of the East. That's Scotty T. I'm Ryan Mork. Scotty T, any last words? Um, You're hungry. I'm hungry. I'm, I'm really starving. hungry. starving. But the Yankees better. Go, come, just win. Just win a game, please. please. Thank you. All right. That's all I got. We are the Beast of the East. Thank you for tuning in. It's not goodbye. See you later. Take care, everybody.